Hi there. Today we are having an adventure in podcasting. Welcome to Adventures in Visibility and this journey today that we're going to take is all about one woman's journey, trip, adventure into <laughs> podcasting. Um, I'm Denise Wakeman, your go ghost. I was going to say your ghost. Well, that's like guide and host. I'm your host and guide to better visibility on the web. I'm not really a ghost, although it might look like I'm in a ghostly background. I have a ghostly background around me, but that's so you can't see the mess behind me. Anyway, welcome to Adventures in Visibility. Um, I also want to let you know quickly before we get going is that Adventures in Visibility is now available as a podcast. If you go to adventuresinvisibilitypodcast.com, you'll be able to listen live on the web or subscribe on your favorite podcasting channel. It's on iTunes, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. So that's, again, adventuresinvisibilitypodcast.com. So today, podcasting, what's new What's old is new again. I'm getting myself all mixed up today. What's old is new again. <laughs> and podcasting has been around for a long time, probably 2004, 2005. Um, I was doing some podcasting back in 2005. But in the last couple of years, it has become hot, 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 hot. Um, it seems like almost every single day I have a colleague uh, you know, announcing that they are starting a podcast, they've just launched a podcast, they're looking for guests to interview for their podcasts. So I think that this is a timely topic for us to talk about on Adventures in Visibility today. Now, um, my guest today is someone very and near and dear to me. Her name is Dr. Ellen Britt. She is my friend, my colleague, and also business partner with The Future of Inc. We're co-founders of The Future of Inc. If you haven't been over there, that's for, uh, it's all about digital publishing for online entrepreneurs. But that's not our topic today. We are talking about podcasting, which in fact is a form of digital publishing. So let me tell you a little bit about Ellen. I'm going to you know, read her bio so I get it right, and then we'll have her talk a little bit about herself too. Um, so uh, Ellen, Ellen is known for her relaxed questioning style. She's an online marketing strategist and telesummit expert. Dr. Ellen Britt has interviewed some of the most respected names in marketing and self-development. Through her Pink Coattails Mastermind, she teaches savvy women entrepreneurs how to take their knowledge and expertise and, and transform it into genuine influence. Now, what she doesn't say, what's not in this bio, is that um, she has interviewed hundreds of well-known people, hundreds, and that makes hot podcasting a perfect outlet for Ellen. So welcome, Ellen. Thank you for being on Adventures in Visibility today. I'm so glad to have you. Well, thank you, Denise. I am delighted to be here. I've been watching your journey on Adventures in Visibility, and when you asked me to be a guest, I, it, that was just icing on the cake for me. So thank you for having me. Well, I can't believe I didn't ask you sooner. <laughs> I didn't think about it. I was like, well, uh, you know. I know. So thank you. <laughs> well, you're welcome. I'm really glad because we're going to be talking all about your journey into podcasting um, because you really took a, you're t you've been taking a deep dive into yes. all things podcasting uh, for the last few months. Now, before we get into that, I would just like to ask you if there's anything else we should know about you before we, you know, your background and what's mm, led you okay. to this place. Yeah, well, um, I came to the marketing world through the world of medicine. I was a PA, a physician assistant in emergency medicine for over two decades, worked in emergency rooms treating people with heart attacks and sewing people up and all that good stuff. But I'd like to say that the experience I got from that, Denise, was that through that, in terms of seeing patients, I actually sat down one night and figured out how many people I had interviewed in terms of patients, and it was enough to fill the Houston Astrodome twice. So I think that's where my love of interviewing comes from, and uh, it, I transition naturally kind of over into the telesummit world. So podcasting, an interview-style show, that is, on podcasting, is a perfect vehicle for me. Okay, so podcasting um, has 
podcasting has been going through a huge resurgence, uh -huh. as I mentioned at the outset. I think it sort of came into being around 2004, 2005. Why do you think that this is happening? Let's kind of well, set the stage here. Yeah, for one thing, the technology has changed. The rise of the smartphone, um, I'm not sure this figure is completely accurate, but I think that I read somewhere there are about a billion smartphones now in the world. And because of the ease of smartphone use and the apps, the consumption of podcasting has become very, very easy. And it also works uh, conversely as well, is that the production of podcasts has become relatively easy. It, it's not you know, uh, completely automatic right now, but there's so many less technical hurdles now to get over, both in the production of podcasting and the listening of podcasting. That's one of the major reasons that podcasting has and is becoming more and more popular. Okay, so um, I know you did a lot of research uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> before you made this decision to um, start your own podcast. Yes. Um, what have you learned? Well, I'm a, that's a huge question and could take five hours. Yeah, but, yeah, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a re <laughs> I'm a research hound. In addition to being a PA, I have a a doctorate in biology for what that's worth but I am very the only reason I say that is because I'm very academically inclined and I tend to research stuff to death so when I saw this blip on the horizon um, late last year I went into full research mode which I love to do anyway and I, li I listened to literally hundreds and hundreds of episodes of podcasts I listened to interviews of podcasters I read a lot of articles I read books and I just I, I, I watched videos and I am convinced that at least for me and my business that I shouldn't walk toward podcasting but I should run and that's what we are doing right now um, for one thing um, I'm a Mac person uh, as you well know Denise and I um, Mac has really or Apple has really led has been at the forefront of the podcasting industry they've been very very supportive I think Android is coming on board slowly but uh, it's Apple which has driven the podcasting world and one of the things that I found out and also one of the things that happened lately if you're an, a Mac person you know that Apple's new iOS system is coming out probably in September they like to shroud their stuff in a little bit of secrecy so I don't know exactly when because uh, they're going to jump on the bandwagon of getting a little bit bigger screen size and phones and everything but there's estimated they're they're estimating that they're going to sell 80 million new units of iOS devices in the fourth quarter of this year alone 80 million and there's a fairly well substantiated rumor that the podcasting app which you used to have to download from the app store and put on your phone or I other iOS device is now going to be permanently installed and non-deletable on all of those 80 million <laughs> devices so there's going to be a whole new audience looking for podcasting plus um, Stitcher the the very popular app and lots of folks who are on the Android platform use Stitcher I, even though I'm a Mac person I, I use Stitcher on my iPhone because I like it as a podcast consumption tool um, Stitcher is going into many major car brands this fall and into 2015 also Google has uh, announced that they're going to put something called Google Play into cars and Stitcher's jumped on that bandwagon too so the capability of people consuming these things in their cars and the things that they want when they want it rather than listening to terrestrial radio is huge so I saw a huge audience expansion it fit well with the gifts and talents that I have and so I just thought the intersection was perfect for me and I think you know I don't think podcasting may be for everybody but I think nearly everyone's business could benefit from it in some way Wow. Okay. Well, that the numbers are huge, yeah. um, and those numbers, as you've indicated, is you know those are things that are coming down the road. Uh -huh. So rather than wait <laughs> until yeah. it had already happened, it sounds like you're you decided that you would you know take advantage of this now so that yeah. you become established before that fact. Is that yes, right? I, yes. I wanted to be proactive because I, I was. I don't know how long I, I was in the fairly early wave of blogging but not early enough and you know how often have you sat around Denise and you think 
wow, I wish I knew then what I know now, you know, what I know now about X. Well, we could say that about podcasting. You don't want to wait two years, four years, ten years and say, oh man, I wish, I wish I'd listened to Ellen Britt on that podcast, on the Adventures in Visibility that day when she was going on about podcasting because she was right on the money. I have never been so certain of a business decision for my own company in my life as the as this decision to pursue podcasting. Never been so certain. Now, you know, with all decisions, I could be wrong, but I don't think so. <laughs> it's, like, okay. it's, like, it's like when, it's like this, Denise. I had gotten so much experience when I was a PA that I, many times, I could walk into a room and I could look at a patient and I would get this kind of gestalt about what was wrong with them before they said a word. That's the feeling I have now about podcasting. I had this kind of gestalt feeling, and it comes, I think, from having done so many interviews and having done a lot of research. I just feel dead certain about it. Okay, well, let me uh, bring up this comment from Barbara. Podcasting, so happy it's on the return. Just read that cars in 2016 may only have satellite radio so people can access her podcast. Not sure what that indicates for radio, though. <laughs> yeah, well, we know what it indicates for radio. A lot of those shows are already on terrestrial radio or available as podcasts. In fact, I listen to my local FM news station via a podcast app on my phone. I never turn on the radio in my car anymore. Wow. Mm -hmm. I listen to the radio all the time in my car. <laughs> well, I I, well, I have a teenager who doesn't want to listen to the same thing I do, so I have one of your buddy and then she has hers, you know. So. <laughs> Ooh, is that legal? <laughs> one earbud? It is in Georgia. <laughs> okay. Boy, it's not in California. One well, I don't know about one earbud, but one ear okay. Bud. okay, we won't... Um, uh, we won't get into the legality of the driving. But I do want to say that um, you're getting a lot of love here. We've got some some um, some veteran podcasters on the show uh, awesome. watching the show today. We have Eileen awesome. Smith. Thank you, Eileen, and thank you for tweeting about the show, Eileen. We have our wonderful friend Kathleen Gage, who we Hi, were Kathleen. talking <laughs> about in the green room, actually, about That's her. Right. Her ears were burning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we're talking about her podcast, Power yes, of we Profits, were. and, uh, you know, she's been going gung-ho on podcasting, too. So, you know, this isn't some, some random thing going on here. All right. So let me, let me get to the next question here. Okay. Um, okay. Probably the most important question about what you're doing is what's the name of your podcast and what's it going to be about? Well, I, you, some people may be wondering why you're having me as a guest on this talk about podcasting when I haven't launched my podcast, uh, which is a legitimate question, but I think that the amount of research that I've done, we've actually recorded nearly 35 interviews already, um, so I've gotten, you know, got that, feel pretty good about that, and we, we have the technology handled but I think my interviewing experience and all that um, you know speaks for itself and we are we are uh, preparing to launch and as uh, Kathleen knows and other folks that have done podcasting know you can't um, you can't say well I'm gonna launch on X date because there are unlike a, a launch when you can turn on a website you are dependent on other things like um, uh, iTunes approval and that kind of thing so we've got Things going. Uh, we hope to launch the week of August 11th. It might be a little bit longer than that, but pretty, pretty soon. And we're launching everything under our Pink Coattails brand. So it'll just be Pink Coattails. Uh, uh, it'll be the Pink Coattails podcast, but I really want it to be known as Pink Coattails because I want to really use podcasting uh, as really a substantial way for people to think about me, my brand, and my business. Okay, well, why don't you tell us a little bit about what that brand and business is so we can understand yeah. you know, okay. the focus of your, of right. your podcast. Well, well. My, my audience, my target audience is women entrepreneurs that have an online component. Now I have worked with women who have brick and mortar um, businesses, but most of the businesses that I've worked with, they are online businesses for the most part. They're coaches, consultants, uh, trainers, um, feng shui experts, so service professionals, and uh, those kind of things. I have worked with some very cool men, but uh, those have come mostly by accident. So I work mostly with women. And I do a lot um, 
to uh, to help them with uh, online visibility strategies and and more of uh, their business models as well because I felt that for many of my clients their business model was not clear they kind of knew what they wanted to do but they didn't have a model set up especially for revenue generation and for things like um, lead acquisition and turning leads into into clients or uh, how to uh, transition over into selling high-end um, uh, ticket items that kind of thing so those are the kinds of things that I work with uh, I work with my clients with and my podcast of course is going to be aimed at that same group the women online entrepreneurs so if you're starting a podcast you want to think about talking uh, in your podcast to the audience which you're trying to reach it doesn't now I could be really interested in something else I you know I might uh, have a hobby on something and hey wouldn't it be cool to start a podcast about that and you can do that but that's not going to help your business you want to talk in your podcast to the audience that you're trying to attract as potential customers because you are going to develop a a very um, engaged relationship. Anytime I've used audio in the past, and I use, and you probably remember this, um, the app, the Audio Boo app, Denise, which was pretty mm -hmm. popular a couple of years ago. It, it's still around, but I don't, I don't like the changes that they made. But I, I did Audio Boo. I guess you could call that a form of podcast, maybe. But th I did those for about a year, uh, nearly every day, and I got such terrific feedback from my audience about the engagement that that people got from hearing my voice and it also was very helpful to me to do those small audios it wasn't very challenging at all and I could just do them in bits I got great feedback and one day um, well, what I would do is I would drive my child to school and I would uh, on the way home I would see like uh, some sort of southern flower or something and I would make it into a business metaphor and I would talk about it well one day I decided to drive through a local chick-fil-a restaurant which is a very kind of southern institution around here and I drove through and decided to do a little audio boo about their customer service and I po uh, when I before I posted it I ended it with the phrase buy y'all well the next day I did my regular one I didn't use the phrase because I wasn't doing something particularly southern and I got this flood of emails and comments on Facebook saying Ellen where is the buy all and that was the first time that I that was like we want to buy all so that was the first time that I was had really been alerted really blatantly that we number one we want you to express your personality in your business and we, it, your, particularly your southern personality, and we resonate with your voice. In fact, because of that audio boo, I got a very high-end private year-long client because she heard that uh, she heard my voice. That's how, that's what led her to me. And uh, the, I think if audio boo <laughs> can do that for me, what could a thirty or forty-minute podcast do for me, where people are going to become regularly engaged? with my voice so I totally I'm agree yeah and I just want to uh, bring in this comment from Kathleen Gage we're all on the same wavelength here I totally agree with Ellen's assessment of where podcasting is going so there you have it more affirmation so Ellen what would you say is um, what's going to make your podcast stand out from all the other marketing podcasts mm -hmm. out there mm -hmm. okay well, I think there's a, I like to say there's a good, there's a formula for a successful podcast. Number one, you have to know your target market. You have to be niched. And then you want to deliver content that's great. Not good content, great content. And that's content that's relevant to your audience and entertaining. And then you want to marry that with good audio production good sound because one of the things that's going to happen Denise is that people are going to get in their cars and they're going to be able to dial up a podcast so maybe they're going to listen to Terry Gross on NPR interviewing somebody with a great production quality and all of the studio sound from NPR and then they flip over to yours and you're talking on Skype and you've got an echo you know <laughs> it's like they're not going to fly right it might not, have it, it might have well, not while, talking about me <laughs> <laughs> no. but a while back it might have but I'm not saying you have to have NPR production quality. That's not what I'm saying at all. In fact, I've gotten some feedback that people think that things that are overproduced, they don't like it. You know, some of these, especially, and not to diss the males too much, but a lot of them love this booming 
radio voice that they get with some of these high-end microphones, you know. And people are just, they don't care about that. They want legibility. They want to be able to understand what you are saying. And they, uh, that's, that's the most thing. If they can't hear what you or your guest are saying and you're not articulating it and your equipment's bad, then they're going to tune away. That's, all, that's the only point I wanted to make about that. Okay. All right. So um, um, where was I going to go here? I had a question in my head. Oh, um, you have said that you feel that there's a lot less competition for podcasting. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit why you think that's true? Well, right now there is. <laughs> like anything else, podcasting is going to become more and more competitive because they're just like anything else in marketing, we all know this, this happens. And because things have sped up, and now because of social media, people find out about things quicker than before, and so more people rush in even faster. So blogging, for instance, when did blogging come on board? Has it been like 15 years or something like that, Denise? I don't know. Yeah, it, it, probably the late... Um late 90s or so. Yeah, something, something like that. it was very different. The, the blogging in those days was very different than it is today. Well, uh, that's right. But it well. grew relatively slowly. But now with the advent of social media and everything, things that come out and pop like this, like podcasting, they're going to grow even ra more rapidly. So if, that, so if blogging had a 10 or 12 year trajectory to become really saturated, podcasting is going to have a, I don't know, I'm going to hazard a guess, a three to four to five year trajectory as opposed to a decade, you know. So, uh, and, and then people say, well, all right, well, what about YouTube? That's very popular. I should be doing YouTube. Well, there's like, and I'm hoping I'm getting my statistic correct, but I think I read there are four, let me see if I've got it written down somewhere, because I was asked, somebody asked me this the other day. I don't think I have it. Let's see. Do I have that here? Uh, yes, there are 4 million hours of new video content every month uploaded to YouTube. <laughs> 4 million hours. And I don't know how many millions and millions of blogs, but the point is that whatever niche that you are in, it's already saturated on the blog. There's a new blog, being English language blog, being started somewhere in the world every half second. Every half second. So your niche is saturated, and I'm not saying not to start a blog. That's not what I'm saying, or not to get on YouTube. But the the place on, in podcasting is relatively unsaturated. By some estimates, there are about 225,000 uh, podcasts now, and many of those, even though they have an active RSS feed, if you go searching around through um, iTunes, you'll see that many of those folks have what we call pod faded. They haven't produced an episode for a year or two or maybe six months, their RSS feed is still active and they are being counted in that statistic. So really there's probably less competition than that. So that's why I say that. Well, there you go. I mean, 225,000, you know, versus gazillions. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so there definitely is an opportunity there. Um, before that, We do have a couple of questions, but before I get to them, I'd like to ask you a question that I think is probably probably the most important question because it takes a lot of time to create a podcast, publish a podcast, mm -hmm. um, create the content for it, produce it, etc. Yes, it does. Um, you mentioned to me privately um, that you intend to make this a primary revenue generator and I did ask permission uh, yeah. if I could ask you this in public uh, just so the audience knows that I'm not prying where I shouldn't be. But, um, uh, can you tell us a little bit how you envision using a podcast as a revenue generator? Because I think a lot of people would be interested in how that works. Well, I think that the path to monetization for a podcast is a multiple, for one thing. And it's a lot clearer to me than just the whole nebulous idea of doing social media. Now, some people have got social media marketing funnels down pat, like Amy Porterfield is a genius <laughs> at it, you know, at monetization. But not all, all of us want to go in that direction. 
So for one thing, if you're building a large and engaged audience, or you're building an engaged audience, what you're going to do if you have a if you if you've niched your podcast and you have quality content and you have fairly good audio production, you are going to have an audience and you're going to ha they're going to be engaged. Well, there's nothing more valuable than an engaged audience. So number one, I can advertise my own products and services to my audience. Through that, I'm going to get through to them a whole lot quicker than I will on email. You know, I, I just will. So I've got a number of programs. I have a high-end mastermind. We are experimenting with some, um, a couple of uh, virtual networking groups. I've got uh, several things that I can just funnel these folks into right away. So why not advertise my own products and services uh, uh, to them at that point? The other thing is, is I can monetize this through affiliate links. If my guests recommend certain things on um, the podcast, then I can link to those things. And it might not be everything that they mention, but some of the things, like if they mention books or other products, I can link to those through an affiliate link on the show notes page on the blog. So I can say, well, go over to the show notes for all the links from today's episode. People go over, they click on that, if that takes them to Amazon or wherever it is, and they purchase, then I'll make a commission. That's a pretty straightforward affiliate model that we all use, uh, that many of us use with our blogs you know, right now. And the other way is that at some point, when your show becomes popular enough and you get enough downloads, then you can consider monetization through a third-party sponsor. If you listen to any podcast at all now, you know the, the popular ones, and I think this is going to grow in the future, but things like Audible.com, Audiobooks, Citrix, uh, GoToWebinar, um, there's any number of folks that um, are corporate people who are already quite aware of the value of an engaged audience. And if you if you listen to those podcasts with your marketer, marketing ears rather than just your podio, podcast consumption ears, you will almost invariably, and I don't, I don't know of an exception to this, that the host, the actual podcast host is the one that's doing those advertisements. They're not switching off to some radio announcer or somebody from the company. They're saying, hey, uh, you know, GoDaddy's got a special coupon for, I'll just make this up because it's not true yet, but for Pink Cocktails, uh, you know, folks, go over and enter such and such a code and you'll get a $1.99 domain or whatever it is. Well, that those are sponsors for those podcasts. Now, you have to have a certain number of downloads to do that, and that's a, a more distant thing. I don't want to want to disabuse people right now of the notion that you can run out, start a podcast, and monetize it tomorrow. It is, that's just, it's just not going to happen. You have to have a well thought out strategy and it is concerted work on your part. Like anything else, Denise, we, you know, both all of us have seen this where people think and clients, they think that they're going to do something and then they're not going to have to work and promote it. And it's just not true. You're going to have to constantly work this just like anything else. It is not a magic bullet. Right. Okay, well, I'd like to get to a question here um, from Nikki Pasquier. Um, Hi, Nikki. <laughs> <laughs> she says, my question to Ellen Britt would be, what extra considerations you have to make given that podcasting isn't visual? Are there any specific tips to keep listeners engaged during a podcast? Well, for one thing, Nikki, I say thank God every day podcasting isn't visual because I don't have to get dressed up to do it. But <laughs> not to make fun of your question, I'm just kidding. But, but really, I mean, for me, I think it's the other way around. If why do I want to look at a couple of talking heads, you know, on a? Uh, for, I mean, just me personally, I would rather listen to audio. And there are people who love visual stuff, and there are people who love audio. But if I'm driving in my car, I can't look at a video. I've got to keep my eyes on the road, you know. So for me, the onus is on the person who's doing the visual to make it interesting, not the audio person. Now, having said that, there's a great grain of truth to what Nikki brings up. I've heard some terrible podcast hosts. They are monotone and they, they're low energy and they just talk really. And it's like, oh, no, I can't listen to this. You, so you've got to cultivate what I call your radio voice, you know, and you've got to inject your personality. You've got to bring a sense of excitement, and, and that depends on your niche. You know, if you're talking about uh, something that's a more serious topic, you've got to modulate that. 
Um, but you've got to bring a sense of there's an, there's definitely an entertainment factor in podcasting that's going to keep your audience engaged. So I hope that helps, Nikki. So it's it's like infotainment, right? That's right. You, that's you right. have to absolutely. Del deliver great information that is valuable to your audience, mm -hmm. and you need to make it palatable, entertaining, so that's that people right. want to keep listening. And um, you know, of course, I'm biased towards video here, doing video hangouts. <laughs> but I, and you, you do a master you do a masterful <laughs> job. It, it it happens to be. A, a gift, and you're just really good at it. For me, oh, okay. it's audio all the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and the thing is that what I realized, um, I'm going a little off topic here, but what I'm, what I realized is that I, in order to reach an, a, a different audience, a bigger audience, is that I need video into podcasts. So that's what I'm doing. So every hangout I do. Mm -hmm is now podcast as well but that's another story but that's a great, so, um, that's, a great that's a great strategy though I mean you're getting and people who do who do just audio so there's some people who are doing slides and putting their podcast up on YouTube so you know there's a lot of cross stuff that you can do right right okay let's go to this question from Evelyn uh, I already have a podcast I'd love to hear what Ellen has to say about getting more traction in iTunes we're 16 episodes in but we are beyond the eight week threshold for new and noteworthy I'd love some specific tips on getting noticed so can first of all can you talk about what new and noteworthy is and then maybe some, yeah. some yeah, new visibility yeah. tips there yeah new Apple has made um, a wonderful thing happen at least for now is like if you were it should be new or noteworthy though instead of new and noteworthy because there is no eight-week threshold for being noteworthy you could get if you're noteworthy and they select you you can be in there anytime so it's new or noteworthy, not new and noteworthy. Now, if you're new, then I think you do have like eight weeks or whatever it is to get in there. Um, so once you're past that threshold, unless you're like really noteworthy, I, I don't, I don't know that you'll get back in there. But regardless of whether that threshold is gone or not, you can do some things to in, to increase your iTunes ranking. You need to think of iTunes as a search engine, just like anything else. And so you, if you will write a keyword-rich description for your podcast, use keywords in the title, and use and look at your very, the various titles of your episodes rather than just episode number one <laughs> you know pink I could say pink hotels episode number one pink hotels episode number two and I have those be my titles but that's not going to get me anywhere in terms of the search engine so if I'm interviewing somebody I'm probably going to put their name in there and maybe a word related to the topic that they're talking about so that when people search on those things they're I'm gonna um, to pop up so you want to think about optimizing just like you would for any other search engine. iTunes is a, is a simpler search engine, of course, but you want to think about writing a keyword-rich description, and also you want to have really good artwork, um, because when people scroll through, they are looking, the first impression they get is your artwork. So if your artwork doesn't stand out, and you've got little tiny type that doesn't um, reduce well. The, the artwork specifications for iTunes now are 1400 by 1400 uh, pixels, and that's got to reduce down to very tiny. If you look at the icons uh, on your Stitcher app, if you use Stitcher, they are tiny. So those things that are crisp and clear and have colors that pop are going to get clicked on much quicker and easier than a muddy looking logo, okay? So hopefully that helps. Those are great tips. Those are great tips. Um, now, what about um, you know? Because this is about you know getting more visibility for your business. Um, do you have any other couple of tips about how we can use? Oops, Denise, you cut out, and I couldn't understand your question. Okay, sorry. I was just saying, do you have any other tips for using podcasting as a visibility tool? Because this is about yeah. building your visibility on the web here. Right. I, for one thing, you don't want to neglect your blog in all of this. Um, technically, you do not have to have a blog to have a podcast. You, because your audio files are not going to be hosted on your blog. You, they shouldn't be. Most web hosts won't allow it. So you're, you're, you're 
hosting your actual audio files on a third party site. Now you may have a player on your blog and they can go there and play it, but it, the actual audio is not streaming from uh, from your site. But you're going to you're going to use your show notes to your advantage. And I don't see that being done very well for the most part. Most people's show notes are kind of sparse and I don't think they are using them effectively to get search engine traffic over to your blog to get more visibility for your podcast. So I would say that's an area where I see a lot of neglect and where I think there's a big opportunity. The other thing is that you've got to continuously promote just like any other thing and now that we have social media, but, but I'm not saying, you know, I don't think you want to say, okay, just like you don't want to say, here's my product, here's my product, buy my product. You don't want to keep saying, here's my show, here's my show, <laughs> here's my show. You've got to do it in a way that you're interspersing that information with content. And also saying, hey, uh, today I interviewed so-and-so, they talked about this, and this is why you should be interested, rather than, here's my episode, you know. So there are ways to do that. So use savvy social media promotion across all platforms and you want to use your show notes to your advantage so hopefully that'll help okay here's a comment from Elizabeth Cottrell there's definitely an intimacy to podcasting the sense of visiting in person with the podcasting host because you've become familiar with your voice their voice and that's certainly something I've heard say a lot is that it's like somebody's in your head and that you know um, yeah and I think one of the reasons people say that and thank you for that uh, Elizabeth is that um, most people consume podcasts via an earbud and so that sense of having somebody's voice literally in your ear contributes to that sense of intimacy and this that is something that's never going to come across from an article on an article directory. It's never going to come across on a YouTube video uh, or even from your blog. Only in podcasting are you getting that sense of intimacy. And it's something I think that just be can be just greatly advantageous, advantageous to your business. Hey. Um, not sure what's going on here, but everything crashed for me. There we uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm here now. I'm on my phone because everything crashed. Ah. And I can't get back online. So I apologize for that. I don't know if we're still live on the. Um, it says live. I see the live on my um, in the upper right hand corner, Denise. Okay. Well, then um, let's. Uh, since we were getting near the end anyway. Um, what I wanted to ask you is, and I feel weird with this so up close to me, but um, <laughs> on my phone. Hey, it's, but, an, it's um, an adventure, right? <laughs> that's right. These are always adventures, and uh, this is uh, this is another one. Um, so, what I'd like to, a couple of things I want to find out. First of all, where can we find out more about when you're going to launch uh, the Pink Coattails podcast, and where can we get information about that? Okay, you can go to pinkcoattails.com. That's my website. There's a little sidebar sign up list, a kind of our first to know list. You could sign up there, and you'll get an email from me saying that uh, we've launched. You can also follow me on. Uh, Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Ellen Britt biz and it will be announced there as well and, or I'm at at Ellen Britt on Twitter okay perfect and then the final question that I always want to ask or love to ask my guests is what has been your most memorable adventure what would you like to share with us that's really easy this is Ellen Britt from pinkcoattails.com and this is my most memorable adventure in 1999, I traveled to China to adopt a child. Going through airport security in Guangzhou, I had my most memorable adventure when I was stopped by the metal detector. As a physician assistant, I had taken an otoscope, which is an instrument to look in a child's ear, with me and had inadvertently left it in my backpack. Of course, the metal detector went off and I was stopped. The guard, who happened to be in full military uniform, stopped me and in, in no uncertain terms asked me what was in my backpack that was long and metal. 
and I had truly forgotten it was there. I was shocked. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't make him understand that it was an otoscope. One of our members who traveled with us fortunately came to my rescue, pointed at me, and said, Doctor, doctor, doctor. The card smiled, and finally we were able to figure it out, and he let me go. But I'll never forget that day on the tarmac, on the way, in a hot August, 15 years ago, to get my little girl from China and being stopped by military security and thinking I was going to end up in jail for the rest of my life. And that's my most memorable adventure. Bye, y'all.